Hey, good evening. How's everybody doing? I'm Steve Greeley, and uh, I'm here representing uh, Citizens for Havasu Schools. And what we wanted to do to this evening, and I see a lot of familiar faces, um, is to answer questions, uh, give you an update regarding the bond and override that was passed uh, well, about a year ago now, believe it or not. So it would be nice to get more of the community out and take part in these opportunities. Um, taxpayers, you know, they want to make sure that their dollars are spent wisely and everything is transparent. And we feel that we've done an excellent job when it comes to that, making sure that anybody that asked any questions along the way got the right answers. And we presented you know, everything the best that we could to our abilities to the public uh, when it came to the uh, ballot a year ago. Um, we have a, a number of people up here that are experts from the school district. And so I can make sure that I do everything properly. Of course, Diana, who is our uh, superintendent of schools, and Michael um, will be up here to talk about um, the bond and the override. And what we thought we'd do a little bit uh, different uh, today was uh, give it more of a state of education. Something that our committee talked about at our last meeting is maybe we open this up to um, not just the bond and the override, which is kind of the, the reason that we wanted to do this, but to expand. Here's the word I'm looking for. Expand um, to any questions that you might have regarding um, our school district here in Lake Havasu City. So, uh, Diana Sayre, um, if you want to come up and take over from here, that would be fantastic. And uh, we will then have a number of people that will come up and, and uh, talk to you about um, where they're at when it comes to the district. And then we'll have Q&A if anybody's interested. But thank you for all coming out here this evening. Well, thank you and good evening. When um, the committee asked to do a state of the district, it's actually going to be things that you've all probably seen before. Different people here have seen different pieces of the presentation. But what we're actually going to do is go through and give you just some general information about the district and what we've been looking at in terms of our needs assessment, and then some very specific information about the override and the bond, and then have the opportunity for anybody who would like to answer questions for any of the greater detail. Certainly, we'd be happy to do that. So just as a beginning point, uh, one of the things that we've talked about, and, I've, and I know all of you are aware of this, as we talked about the whole America's Best City and, and all of those competitions, is that education impacts every single component of our lives as citizens. And so we know that our economic development is also dependent on our education, but everything that we do in our city as, a, as an insular city depends on our children being educated and um, being astute citizens of our community. I did include here a little bit of information that's at the bottom, and if you all can see that, it's a little bit small. Whoops. Let me go backwards. There we go. Uh, our actual, all right. There, there is no animation. It's all me. I apologize. The actual population of Lake Havasu is about 54,000 people, and what's interesting about that number is that our student population is a little over 5,400. And so we align really um, with our city population currently. And that is within 43 square miles. And we have 5,348 businesses in our community serving those number of, of folks. How we get where we need to go is through intelligent direction and skillful execution of our plans, which means we do need to have plans and have a sense of where we are so that we can move forward. This year, one of the things that our board worked diligently on was revising our mission. Our new mission statement for the school district, and you'll start seeing it out more, we're still in the process of putting it into our stationery and emails and so forth, is the Lake Havasu Unified School District will engage each student with a focus on scholarship, character and humanity, so that all students may graduate with the academic and social skills necessary to become responsible citizens and contributing members of society. To that end, how we get there 
one of the first things we do is we have facilities. So you can see here a list. This is our school properties that we have and the square footage that those consume. Our district has nine facilities, which cover a total square footage of 781,433 square feet. We have a student population. You have a sense of the, the population. Because of our data reporting, I went ahead and broke it down by some of the categories that we look at. Primarily, our population is Hispanic and white. Um, we do have a little over half of our students that are receiving free or reduced lunch, which means that they're living um, in what would be considered poverty. We do have over 12% of our students that qualify for special services, receive special education services some, of some sort, but we only have under 2% of our students who are English language learners. So our students are speaking English, although they may not necessarily have the academic language that they need to be successful in school. And our total population as of today was 5,550 students. That changes every single day. This is a chart that shows a little bit about where we started the, the year, comparing 16 to 17. And what I want you to observe here, in, and I'll give you a second just to look at that, is that we opened the year and we close the year down from where we started. So every year this is a pattern. We start with more students than we end up with. Uh, in 2016-17, we started with 55.73. We ended with 53.85. The first day of school, we actually started with 54.81. And then as of 10.27, we were down to 54.24. Our projection is lower than what we end up at because we need to look at where we think we're going to end in terms of our funding. But we're on a downward trend in terms of enrollment for the Lake Havasu District. And if you look at this, I realize this is very busy, but just to give you a very quick look, if you look at 0809, we actually look at the total. We started out with over 6,000, 6,300, almost 6,400 students. We ended with 6,100, so we lost 236 during the year. So we're coming down here, 5,573, we lost 188. We run about a 12 to 14 percent transience rate. That's the numbers of students who withdraw during the year. We've talked about our student achievement, and these are the ways that we measure student achievement. We do administer the AZ Merit, which is the standards based test uh, required by the state of Arizona. We provide our own benchmark assessments through our Galileo system. Uh, we do administer AIM Science, also one of the Arizona State tests. And for our primary grades, we use DIBBLES, which is the basic reading assessment. And that's how we ensure that our students are reading by third grade, is measuring that. Many of you have seen our achievement chart. The three years that we've been administering AZ Merit shows here. And we have the chart that shows from grades 3 through 11, which are the grade levels that are actually assessed. We can see from grade three in 2015 to 16 to 17, when you look across the chart here, this essentially measures the continuity of the curriculum. So the students are getting very similar curriculum. They're still achieving at about 52%, a little bit of a gain in the percent that are passing the assessment. When you look at the vertical alignment, knowing that the test gets a little bit more difficult each year from third grade to fourth grade to fifth grade, you see the pattern of student growth. And so what we are measured on in our state assessment system and in our grading system is the percent of students who are passing as well as the percent of students who are making growth. So both of those are important figures. And the math assessment results here as well. At the primary levels, we perform much higher in math than we do at the secondary level. That's an area of focus for us. This shows the information regarding the elementary performance. And what this illustrates is that the state performance, performance excuse me, is here, and our district performance is here. You'll notice that there's a fourth grade, something to do with the assessment. Statewide, fourth graders do a little bit better. That's true in our district as well, and that trend is down. 
When you look at our individual schools, however, you'll notice that we have some, some great variations in how we perform by grade level. And that is one of the pieces of information that we use to inform the work that we do throughout the year in order to get better. The same thing is true for mathematics. At the elementary level, we perform much better than the state average. But again, we have some, uh, some differences in how our students perform by grade level by school. At the middle school, the state is the light bar, which I realize is a little difficult to see on this screen and the school is the dark bar. So you can see in language arts, the seventh graders perform above the state level, the eighth graders are below. In seventh grade mathematics, the seventh grade performs above the state level, the eighth graders here are significantly below. What this doesn't show, which I wanna go back a chart and show you here, is that is that over a fourth of our eighth grade students take Algebra I, which is the ninth grade assessment. And so in that chart, they don't show those students, they just show the eighth graders who take the regular eighth grade assessment. We do have 96% of our students passing that algebra assessment, that's over one fourth of the eighth graders. At the high school level, Again, you see the state comparison. English language arts is by grade level. So we have ninth, 10th, and 11th. So 10th grade is slightly above. Ninth is right about the same as the state average and 12, 11th is a little bit below. In mathematics, the algebra one is performing under the state average, geometry above, and algebra two above. So we do see those um, patterns for our assessment results. Our high school graduation rate is very high. The 2016-17 will be right at 90%. Again, significantly above the state average, which runs about 80%. We also look at our discipline. What kinds of issues do we have with our students? And we have extended suspensions and expulsions for serious offenses. What you can see is a pattern over time. And around 2010, 11, and 12, these numbers got very high. We were large there, but not as large as we were down here, if you remember back to that enrollment chart. Uh, but this was during the, the uh, deepest part of the recession. We went back in here, we look at 2017, total suspensions, uh, extended suspensions were 71. So our pattern went dipped, came back up, and we're looking at those numbers very carefully. I mentioned the curriculum and the discipline because those specifically are the two subcommittees or excuse me, advisory committees that the board has identified to focus on for this year. And as you might expect, most of that is at the high school level. That's where we see those kinds of incidences, 56 of those incidences. But this is what we see that's also an interesting trend. Another thing that we look at when we look at our information is that 24 of the total were drug related. That could also be paraphernalia. Doesn't necessarily mean that they were in possession of drugs. And 20 of them were for fighting. We had a few here for alcohol and then other were uh, minor things. But those are the two big areas that we do see at our high school. And knowing that data, again, helps us to focus. Attendance, this is again a busy chart. But what you can see here is that we tend to run at the beginning of the school year, very low absence rates. They get a little bit higher in the middle toward the end of the year. Uh, generally, our district runs at about 94% attendance every day. Some information about our staffing. Currently, we have 235 full-time support staff positions in our district, and we have 27 part-time uh, positions. So we're talking about, again, a little over 250 employees that are support staff in our district. Right now we have three openings. Our turnover rate, and this relates back to the override, in 1516 to 1617, we had a 16% turnover, turnover rate. From 1617 to 1718, which is after the override was passed, we had a 9% turnover rate. 
So we talk about the positive impact of having those funds and having that community support. We see it with our classified staff here, but we also see it dramatically with our certificated staff. We have 255 certified positions. Again, our um, turnover rate, 15-16, was 22%. From 16-17, 8%. Huge difference. Our teacher experience index is another thing we look at in terms of looking at the quality of our, of our uh, education and our students. This year, we have 72 teachers who have one to five years experience, but we have an increase in our teachers that have six to 10 years experience. We're up to 51, and we have 125 that have 11 to 15 or more. And so our experience is tending a little bit towards the more mature, which helps us in the expertise that we're able to build and in the um, uh, continuity of our curriculum as well. We spent some time this summer and uh, early fall looking at what we call the comprehensive needs assessment. And there were six areas that we looked at. Effective leadership, teachers and instruction, organization of time, curriculum, conditions, climate, and culture, and family and community engagement. The area that we determined needed the most focus was the effective curriculum. So I'm gonna go very quickly through a couple of slides here. When we talk about effective leadership, we, we gauge these things on the surveys that we have within our district. When we talk about our, our organization of time and our ability to provide enrichment, we look at all the different calendars and options that we have there. The things that we offer to students that give them an engaging experience include the rotations of our specialists where every student is exposed to PE, art, and music, and also some of the co-curricular and extracurricular activities that we have. All kinds of things are happening for our students to be involved in that get them engaged in school. The area that we are weak in, however, is the curriculum. So I do want to spend a moment here talking about standards and rigor and curriculum. The standards, and there's a lot of uh, confusion about this in the, uh, even among our own profession, the standards are those skills that students are expected to learn. So an example here is in uh, grade three, by the end of the year, proficiently and independently, independently read and comprehend literature, including stories, dramas, and poetry, in a text complexity range determined by qualitative and quantitative measures appropriate to grade three. So that is the standard. How do we teach the student to do those things is the curriculum, the materials that we use to teach those things. 3.1 RI 10 is the same exact standard, but it talks about informational text, including history, social studies, science, and technical text. So while we're teaching the other subjects, we're teaching informational reading. What you'll notice again, though, is that by grade six, those standards are still reading level, uh, reading and literature 10, reading for information 10. By sixth grade now, it says, with qualitative and quantitative, quantitative measures appropriate to grade six. So while we're teaching the same things that are vertically aligned, the level of depth, the level of complexity, uh, the application and critical thinking skills that students are required to utilize change as they move up through the grade levels. And that is where the assessments are looking at growth, is from, from being able to do these things at grade three to being able to do them at grade six, they should look very different and measuring competency as a higher level of competency. So when we talk about the curricula, effective curricula are the evidence-based resources that are used to teach those standards. And this addresses back to the teachers and effective instruction on those principles. We have teachers who know how to teach those standards, but they need to have those aligned resources or find those aligned resources that help them to teach to the level of rigor that that student needs to learn at that grade level. So where we discovered that we were particularly lacking is when we looked at our curriculum adoption materials. This is the list of, in, of the materials for grades one through six, um, K through six, excuse me. And our reading adoptions go back to about 2006. 
with some even earlier than that, 2003 on social studies, um, pretty old. When we look at middle school, again, these are the texts. The history of social science is 1998. And then we look at the high school, and I, um, I had to go back and look this up because our English texts, which are no longer available in print, are from 1989. We've had updated editions, but that is that text, and they're not available. So we do know we have some areas to work on. Our board will be looking at curriculum and discipline this year, as we will as a district, and uh, we'll be working with teachers and staff and community in those areas. So I'm going to transition now to the override, which I alluded to. When we started this campaign, and, and Steve um, and the Committee for Citizens for Havasu Schools was certainly the ones that got this going, and I was not here for that. But the commitment that we made to the community was that if this override was passed, we would address the insurance benefits, we would address salary, both base pay and longevity, we would decrease athletic fees, that we would actually demonstrate fiscal responsibility if the community were to provide that support for us, and that we would plan for sustainability. And so what we ended up bringing to the board as a result of the override, which was approximately $3.9 million in uh, one annual 15% uh, year, was base salary, benefits, and longevity. We looked at increasing base salary. Now one of the things about fiscal responsibility is knowing that an override lasts for five years at full funding and seven years total, but the the actual commitment to paying those salaries is forever. It doesn't go away after five years. So how do we plan to implement that, but at the same time figure out ways that we can save the money so that we can pay for it if we do not have another override? So what we looked at was um, adding to the base salary a certain amount, which comes up to approximately $10 a day. And based on the number of days, uh, including our fixed costs, this was a commitment of about $1.4 million was to base salaries for all staff. I would mention that this also addressed the minimum wage increase for our classified employees. So that brought everybody up to $10 an hour. That was partly why um, we calculated that to $10 a day was based on that. We also did a 5% increase to the employee benefit trust contribution that the district makes on behalf of employees and that equaled out to about $216,000. And then we talked about the district contribution for dependent benefits. Currently, the district pays um, $465,000 a year in dependent benefits, and those costs we talked about having to move those eventually to the employee. And so we talked about a transition plan for that. So what we looked at was for our dependent benefit, in order to give people time to plan for that, that for 16, 17, and 17, 18, we would pay that completely. When we looked at 18, 19, uh, and we have not approved this yet, this was just the recommendation for planning, is that that would be about, a, um, that the uh, employees would assume about 10% of those costs, which would be that the employees would pay 46,000 and the district would pay 418,000. And so over time, the employees would assume more of that cost until we had, um, approximately 70% of the cost of benefits going to employee paid by 24-25. This was a proposal for budgeting. The only thing that was board approved was that for 17-18 that we would have the 10, uh, the 0%. Uh, we did look at providing 200,000 to athletics to help reduce the athletic fee and then a contribution to the EBT reserve so that that would not have um, instability. And then longevity in order to reward those who had been with us for a while. So what we did is for 17, 18, which was a one-time cost, depending on how long the individuals had served in the district, they were given a supplemental pay 
based on last year's salary. The first half of this pay was distributed last week, and so we actually have um, some of this done. But for example, if you have been here 20 years or more, you would get 10% of last year's pay over two paychecks as a longevity for a supplemental pay for this year only. So looking at this, what we had to plan for was ongoing costs. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about inversion, but there were some things we needed to address in our salary schedule here. Uh, so for ongoing costs, we committed to 2.1 million ongoing just in this one year of budget, which means that if the override goes away, we're going to have to find 2.1 million in our budget to continue just these that we gave this year. The one-time cost was the longevity the athletics and the contribution to the EBT. And so we actually spent for the 17-18 school year $3.96 million. The board did approve this and we went forward. We also committed to looking at a salary study because we did have a lot of things that we discovered in looking at the schedule uh, so looking at all three of our categories, certificated, classified, and administrative, looking at like-sized demographics, um, districts with geographic conditions that were similar to us, and looking at various things like entry, midpoint, and maximum rates, maximum hours per day, number of contract days, the kinds of things that you would look at in comparing positions, knowing that we're going to have some gaps between our district and other districts. Our plan for this winter is to look at the salary study that we did. And I think our employees know, but everybody is hopeful, we are not going to be able to implement all of the recommendations from the salary study. There is not enough money to do that. Uh, however, based on the dollars that we do have available, we can identify the highest priority areas as a, as a team and make some adjustments for the 18-19 school year. So our plan, oops, that came out weird. Our plan would be to review those implications, um, analyze the impact of raises for 18, 19, and 19, 20, and then also create a plan for that override uh, income going through 19, 20. We are recommending for 18, 19 that we continue with a one-time longevity. And we're setting aside, based on everything that we can here, we have to add are 50 cents an hour because our minimum wage goes up to 1050 and so that is equal to about 3% for certificated. The 200,000 set aside for the salary study that we would commit to ongoing brings us up to just under 3 million ongoing if we commit to this at the end of next year. We do have a lot of things to think about. Of course, the implementation of Prop 206, because that goes up to $12 an hour for minimum wage. Our district enrollment trends, as you've noticed, they are going down, and so the amount of money we actually get per student, or excuse me, the actual number of students we have that we get money for. Uh, we also have current year funding, which means that we only get paid for the students who are showing up. Because we lose kids every month and lose almost 200 kids by the end of the year, our funding actually will be going down throughout the year as opposed to being standard. And then of course the actual tax dollars that we collect, we're sure hoping we get that 3.9 million collected this year because we've committed it. And then we have to look at staffing formulas and some other things as well. So our commitment is to continue to look for ways to reduce our maintenance and operation expenditures for sustainability. And we want to communicate over and over again our gratefulness um, for the fact that we've met the promises we made in the override campaign and we were able to do that. All right, Mr. Murray. Thank you for being here tonight. I have my phone in front of me so I can make sure that I keep track of the time. I know that
that your time is valuable, and I don't want to take that away from you. Uh, tonight, my portion is to review the bond proceeds and just give you a brief update. I want to leave time for questions and answers uh, because I believe that's probably where uh, most of you, if, if you have questions, you'd like to ask specifics, so I'd like to uh, be available and some of our directors to be available to answer those questions. First of all, I'd like to thank um, Mrs. Asire for her leadership and for all that she does with this district. It's um, uh, pretty amazing to me as uh, we sit in directors' meetings each week and have an opportunity to sit down and, and be guided by her vision and as well as the directors who sit at that table. Uh, I, I sit there and sometimes feel inadequate because of their their uh, expertise and wisdom and all that they do. So I appreciate Mrs. Miner and uh, Ms. Walter, Mr. Gardner for all that you do in your different departments. Tonight, our first issuance, I jumped ahead there. You'll recall in May of this year, a few months back, the bonds actually went out to market and were sold over the market and just over $16 million was actually um, given to the district and made available to the district for expenditures of bond funds to start beginning to fund bond projects approved by the, by the voters in last November. There are three issuances. Uh, the one, like I mentioned, occurred in May in 2017. There'll be an upcoming one in 2020, and then another one in 2023. Those can change. Uh, the dates are not set in stone. They, could, they can be moved forward if need be. Uh, they can be extended if need be. Um, so typically, though, we're looking at these years of 2020 and 2023 to come. The four areas, major areas that we're focusing on with the bond has to do with maintenance and transportation, technology, and athletics. Currently in progress, you'll see up here on the screen, in maintenance, we have uh, flooring that uh, we're in the works right now of actually uh, producing a scope of work that would allow us as a district to formulate a plan as to how exactly we're going to uh, address our flooring needs within each of our buildings, our facilities, as we saw on an earlier slide. And obviously, um, you can imagine that when you have uh, thousands of, of students in our buildings that it's very difficult to take the flooring out from under them and replace it while the most important thing is happening and that's learning. So we have to develop a scope of work, a plan as to uh, how much we can spend in a certain period of time and exactly where we can uh, focus our attention so that we can address those flooring needs without disturbing the classroom environment or at least trying not to disrupt it uh, the best we can. Uh, in maintenance also, uh, recently the weatherization project for this high school, this very facility that we're sitting in, uh, was approved through the school facilities board to uh, actually pay for a weatherization project. Uh, roughly about $1.7 million was actually approved through the state to make that happen, which will then allow us to address there's, there's one area that I can see that um, needs to be addressed, and we brought that to a work session several months ago to be very clear as to um, an area of need, and that was addressing our athletic fields. Uh, unfortunately, um, in, the, in the budgeting process, there, there was, for whatever reason, a, an oversight as to um, allocating proper dollars to our athletic fields at the high school and we are in the process of addressing that. I believe we have a very clear path as to how to make that um, happen, and thanks to the SFD for allowing, uh, for them stepping up and actually uh, approving a capital project that should have been funded by the state anyways, um, we're able to take some of those bond dollars that were allocated for the painting of this facility, which wasn't even close to 1.7 million, by the way, and reallocate those uh, to the athletic fields. Um, that is the only area that I can see. I know there was some discussion as to, well, if this happened, then where else are we falling short? 
this is the only area that I can see where that has happened. Um, and we are addressing that, and we have addressed that, and, the, and I believe we do have a clear path in moving forward. The total bond dollars that went before the voters, I believe it was very clear. I know I sat in at least two meetings where this was clearly articulated, the fact that these bond dollars will not address every single capital need within this district. We've gone far too long with, without adequate capital funding to this district and districts across the state to address every single capital need. There's no way we'll be able to replace every single air conditioning unit, replace every square inch of carpet and flooring in each of those nine facilities of 780 some thousand square feet. We'll be able to make a big dent in doing that. And we will prioritize and we will be very efficient in how we do that. That's part of, of the pledge of, I know, our school board and, and leadership within the district and community leaders as well, especially through the Citizens for Havasu Schools group, to be very clear and open and forthright and, and, and you come to our board meetings and, and we'll talk about it and we will, we will open up the books and display it up on the big screen to show you exactly where, where things are being spent. And that's my pledge as the business director to not only those who are in the audience or those who are employed employees of this district, but uh, those who are community members and taxpayers. Um, and I happen to be one of them. So this is our pledge. This is uh, the commitment that, that I have personally, and I know that's within the administration as well, to be very open and very uh, transparent. And that seems to be the key word of the day. Um, but I think it's, in a very, it's a very important word because it, it speaks to who we are as people and bringing the community in and trusting in what we do. Technology, you'll see that uh, currently we are addressing our network. We have um, wiring and cabling and uh, this fiber backbone that's, that's going through each of our buildings and district office. We have servers being put in place computer labs uh, that have already been um, replaced and upgraded with new equipment, uh, printers and peripherals that allow teachers to be able to use um, equipment for instructional purposes. That's coming in, it seems like, almost daily to the warehouse. And all of these figures are being tracked, and we'll get to that here in just a minute. Transportation, uh, we're hoping that uh, tomorrow, actually, I'll be meeting with um, our, my transportation supervisor and we're going to be looking at the maintenance fleet specs which are right there. Uh, we have some maintenance fleet that uh, part of this bond sale that uh, requires us or is we've asked for uh, bond dollars to be spent in our maintenance fleet which includes um, facility as far as um, trucks, maintenance trucks, um, equipment that our maintenance department uses. We have some vehicles that are, that are decades old and uh, some vehicles that uh, probably shouldn't be in use, but we are, where we maximize everything we have, but for efficiency purposes and safety, and we, we're addressing that as part of the bond. The buses have been on order, as you can see. They are on order. They should be arriving here uh, around February. Uh, they are in the, in the works of being built and delivered hopefully around February for those three buses you see. Uh, our athletic fields, um, we are in the design phase. Tomorrow, about 11.30, I have a meeting with the architect and the evaluation committee who is in the process of finalizing their evaluations to procure a general contractor for our athletic facilities. Uh, we had two general contractors who um, submitted their proposals to the district uh, during that proposal. Um, request for qualifications period that we went out for procurement and, and allowing people to respond to that, that call for a procurement for a general contractor. And we had two who responded, uh, both are from the Phoenix area. And so we are looking to finalize that uh, or at least determine the next stage tomorrow. And we're hopeful that we'll bring that name to the board here on the 17th of November for um, approval.
that sheet that I was talking about is right here as far as being open and, and having that displayed uh, on the big screen or in my office or wherever it may be. We are tracking every expenditure. Uh, you'll see that this sheet very much mirrors the Citizens for Havasu Schools pamphlet that went out, that uh, pamphlet just before the bond election. Um, this mirrors that for tracking purposes, so that way uh, we display this during board meetings. Not every board meeting, but most board meetings. We just had an annual October 17th, as required by state statute, meeting where we actually uh, propose um, and display the expenditures to date for our bond, and that is also a question and answer period where people can come in from the public and ask questions similar to this forum here tonight. You'll see that budget and amounts are here, and as these populate, and this is just a, a sheet that, this isn't the up-to-date sheet, this is the, the template sheet, so don't, don't worry about it. We have, it, we have spent some money here. Uh, but you'll see that when you look at this sheet that you will have a percentage of bond dollars that were spent based on the budget that was displayed in that Citizens for Havasu Schools pamphlet. Uh, the total bond expenditure for this particular area, in this case it happens to be HVAC, and then you'll see plumbing and so forth. It's a long spreadsheet that'll have a lot of detail to it. There's actual multiple tabs down at the bottom where I can track every expenditure by purchase order and then all of those dollars will, will calculate and then populate this sheet here to give us just a bottom line number. So this is the sheet uh, that is available to all. It'll be something that you'll see quite often if you come to a, a governing board meeting each month. Um, by way of communication, we have our monthly board meetings that all are welcome to attend. It's open to the public. We have uh, Speak Out, as you know, our radio stations, uh, radio station here in town uh, grac graciously gives us time as a district to uh, allow us to be a participant in that program. Usually the last week of the month, uh, I will be there with whoever is also scheduled to speak uh, at Speak Out and present. Uh, just a short segment, give a, a quick bond update as to where we are. Sometimes when I, when I come, the information is pretty much the same as it was last month. I'm only reporting on, I report on progress, but I'm also reporting hard numbers on completion. Uh, I'm not populating this sheet until I get an actual invoice showing that the project or the material has been shipped and received and billed because as you know, a lot of times you can purchase a product or at least fill out a purchase order and then something happens with the shipping that could either fluctuate the price either up or down and I wanna make sure that uh, we're reflecting actual accurate invoice numbers on this sheet. And then again, as I mentioned before, required annually by state statute ARS 15-491, we're required at least annually between the months of September 1st, or the dates of September 1st and October 31st to hold a public meeting in which we uh, display our current expenditures in our bond funds. And that just happened on October 17th. So I invite you all to be a part of these meetings, to come and ask questions, to share your thoughts and input. Uh, we're here to show you exactly what we have nothing hiding. Um, again, the only thing that I could see that might have been miscalculated had to do with the athletic fields, and again, that was a topic brought to my attention and a concern that I think some people in the community had about, well, if this happened, then what else, what else is wrong? Uh, from what I can see, this, this was a miscalculation, a mis, um, at some point of reading a, a quote and not reading the entire quote, and the actual quote was uh, a little bit lower than it should be because there were some exclusions within that. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we've identified it, we held that work session so that we can bring that to the community and gain public input as to where do we go from here. And 
we've done that. We I think we have a clear path as to where we go from here. And thanks again to the SFB for coming up and stepping up with that weatherization project. Um, we have a more defined path to fulfill every every uh, obligation that we have with those athletic fields, um, namely Lee Barn Stadium. Because I know that there were a lot of questions and a lot of um, people who were hopeful to have certain types of amenities there, and I believe that we have a path to make that a reality. So with that, in summary, the bond will, for our students, improve the learning environment as we bring technology and improve facilities. Uh, work conditions matter, and that goes for our staff. When you have a work environment that, that is comfortable and it allows you to have the things you need to comfortably learn and to uh, do what you've been asked to do by, as, the employee, as the employee, as the staff member, as that teacher and instructional leader up in front of that classroom, if you have the things that you need, um, learning will take place and the environment does matter, so our work conditions do matter. So with that, are there any questions? And I will answer. Mrs. Asire is here. There are a few other directors that are here. If there are any questions, we would like to do our best to answer them. Yeah. I think a microphone is coming your way. You had mentioned um, that one of the areas that we we're going to focus on in the district uh, was curriculum, and one of those notes was um, providing the uh, adequate resources to our teachers. Can you talk a little bit on, on that? Um, have we talked about funding for that, budgeting for that in the future, and what will that look like, just so the community knows, too, because there's a process to, you know, um, adopting new curriculum and such, just so they know it's not gonna be an automatic thing. Right. Thank you. Um, so, basically what we're doing right now is looking at what exactly do we have and what are we using? So where are our gaps? So, so that whole gap analysis. So what do we have, what do we need? Um, then looking to see what's available, because one of the issues that, that seems to be coming up is that there aren't very good materials that are adequately aligned. And then identifying, once we look at those gaps and needs, what are our priorities? And then finally, what would it cost to do that? So how much can we, how much do we need? I don't wanna say we only have this much because we don't know how much we actually need, but then looking to say, okay, how can, what can we do first? What do we need the most and how much money can we identify for that? We have, um, Mr. Murray was talking about our director's meeting this morning because that was actually one of the conversations that we had was looking at the places that we currently have and thinking about already next year's budget, where can we say um, we have dollars sitting here that we can set aside for a curriculum adoption? And knowing the good part about that is right now that's a one-time commitment, it's not an ongoing expenditure. So if we do have a little bit of extra, we can set that aside but we won't actually create those priorities until we look and, and do our actual gap analysis. Does that help? Yeah. And just, if I can just clarify as well, we, as part of that meeting and our commitment from, from my office is to make sure that as that information comes to me, as we begin to develop a budget for next year and, and the years to come, that we have, we have those needs identified and the dollar amounts attached to it and it, it, at that point, it all becomes budgeting, as we all know. It's no different than our own personal checkbook, that if you establish and identify a need and you identify the dollar amount, the dollar amount attached to that, it's much easier to, to put together a plan to achieve that, that purpose and to be able to make that, that uh, need to become a reality. So I, we're committed, uh, at least from my office, and I know all the directors are, are clearly communicating and those conversations like Mrs. Asire are taking place even today. Um, so we are looking ahead for that. 
if I may add to that also, a big piece of this, I mean, there's a process for all of it. And until we've identified the need, then we begin that whole process for looking at materials, adoptions, et cetera. Um, but one of the issues that is continuing to be, and, and I've, uh, is, is what's ongoing and what isn't. Because if you saw the override, we've got almost 3 million that we're planning to have ongoing expenditures past the length of or life of that override. And so we have to budget that very carefully. Um, every year is going to be a sense of what, are, what is our priority for this year. So if we can build a certain amount of carry forward into the budget, this year it may be that we're going to purchase these materials. The next year it might be that we look at these equipment pieces. Uh, we, so we really are going to have to have a long-term plan for that. Um, one question that keeps being asked of me for um, the district is Prop 123. I saw up there um, things, but I didn't see funding from Prop 123, so I didn't know if that's in any of the considerations or how it's being used, or do we even know as a district how much do we actually get? Prop 123, last year, uh, you'll recall that's the year that we received Quite a, quite a bit of money because they they uh, the state allocated certain dollars for that to to try to make us closer to whole than than we were before. Um, now what is happening? If you look at page seven of the actual adopted budget, down at towards the very bottom of that, there is actual just a dollar amount that's attached to and, and included within the normal budget limit. Uh, that is also a report that we can pull um, through ADE's website. It's available to all, and we take that dollar amount and we just include it within the budget, and it becomes part of your general budget limit. So, if your general budget limit's twenty-six million dollars, that two hundred and it's right now it's around two hundred and twenty, two hundred and thirty thousand dollars, just off the top of my head, for Prop One Two Three. That's just figured into teacher salaries and regular expenditures. Thank you for this information, by the way. I, I, I wish we had more people from the community and teachers and staff and everybody that were filling this room because it took a lot of effort to get to where we are now, and I think you're doing a good job in making sure that we're getting the information. So hopefully we'll continue to get have more meetings and updates and maybe we'll have a bigger audience but um, to, to add on to uh, Carol's comment on the prop 123 and the 301 money that has was allocated for the insurance benefits I know that um, the the largest majority if not all of what um, we received last year went towards helping to um, fund those premiums and I know that uh, there's been 301 money that has um, been going towards that cost as well. And I had a question come up the other day of um, is if, if the 301 money, or I guess there's, there's different categories, and um, if that money is going for all of the employees' premiums um, or just classified or, um, so that's my first question, so if you couldn't, if you wouldn't mind. So that's a good question. Uh, hopefully I can answer all of those little questions within that question. Uh, for 301, there's a fund 11, 12, and 13. And fund 13 is what you're referring to. Fund 13 is the actual fund that allows a district to allocate monies from Prop 301 Fund 13 um, to help in other areas uh, of the district, and insurance is one of those. And the insurance money goes into the EBT, and that is, that is there to support those teachers who are actual 301 qualified teachers. So the amount of money going from Fund 13 to the EBT covers the staff members who would receive 301 dollars. That's not for classified staff or administrators. It actually is there to help offset some of the costs that would go to a certified staff member who, who can collect 301 money. Thank you. And then the other question I had was on the technology uh, piece for the computers and servers and all that. I know that we're doing a 
major overhaul with that. And I heard you say that, um, or maybe I thought I heard you say that there were parts and pieces and equipment coming in all the time and they were being warehoused. Um, what What's the timeline for actually installing or implementing that? And the warehouse, I'm assuming, is of a climate that's not going to hurt all of that equipment if, if it gets too hot or too cold? Yeah, another great question. When, when, I meant, wh when I said warehouse, I meant that it's received to the warehouse and almost immediately, because I, I try to frequent the warehouse on a daily basis, uh, almost immediately that product is, is turned around and actually pushed back out into the buildings. In some cases, it sits there for a few days, uh, but mo almost immediately it's, in, it's received and then inventoried and then pushed back out to the school site. Yeah, the warehouse, definitely, I would agree. It's probably not, especially in, in August. It's not the best place to keep it. Yeah, wait till October when they harden back up again. come up a couple of times is there a plan for prep 301 sunsetting is that something that you're discussing discussing um, no I mean discuss it on the in, the in our minds and in the back of our mind yes actually re read an email just today uh, from from ASBO it's one of the school business officials uh, groups and it's it's a real reality, and it's a reality. It's coming up here in the in the near future, and it's not just talked about here locally, but it's a statewide concern. Um, so as far as the actual plan, um, I I can't say that we're putting a whole lot of effort into doing that right now, this very minute. But it is definitely on the short list to address because that is creeping ever so quickly closer to us. I would like to mention also on 301, at the county superintendent's uh, meetings, that has been a topic of discussion as well, and along with the Arizona Rural Schools, because there will be different propositions that will come forward in order to resolve the 301, whether it will come forward as it exa exists exactly now or other, um, other versions. And uh, one of the big discussion points is going to be uh, coalescing the education community around supporting whatever version is decided to support. So it's some of that discussion is just, there's a lot of speculation now. If we do this, what might happen? If we do this, what might happen? Um, and then speculation around whether the governor is going to allow it to go on the ballot, you know, those kinds of things. And it's, it's so much up in the air that it's almost too chaotic for us to grab onto yet. But it is on everyone's radar. And almost all of us, I would say, it's, it's happening at personnel meetings, at ASBO meetings, at superintendent meetings, we're hearing versions of that discussion. I can speak a little bit about 301, what I know from the state level. Um, the governor's re-election is coming up in less than a year or thereabouts. And uh, I know that a lot of emphasis is gonna be put on education this year in the legislature. And I know that 301 um, is number one on the governor's priority and to align his ducks in a row in 19 so that he can prepare for 20 so that he can do a 301 that is hopefully larger than the current 301. We can start calling on people too if we'd like. We put them on the spot. Can we ask questions of you? <laughs> thank you. And I want to thank Mr. Greeley too for his leadership. I, I meant to do that when I came up here. That was on my mind. And thank you.
So as you can see, there's a lot of wheels in motion, and we thought it was very important, the committee, that we tried to hold um, additional uh, education town hall meetings. Uh, that's something we pledged to do when we brought the bond and override to the public and what we pledged to do, we will always follow through, no matter how many people turn out. So hopefully we can get the word out a little bit better uh, next time uh, with a more of a turnout. Those that have made the effort to come here tonight, thank you very, very much. Um, much appreciated. And uh, we'll try to do these. I think the committee had discussed on a quarterly basis when needed. Um, so probably sometime in the spring, we'll have another update. As taxpayer monies are spent, I think that you can see that the district takes it very seriously. And my hat is off and applauds, applauds should go out to the district for all their hard work to make uh, what they're trying to do a better school system, better schools, better students, better community. It all you know, comes together. And uh, I, I can tell you this is by far the most in-depth um, uh, information that, that I've ever heard of from the district over the years. And once again, uh, thank you very much for all the hard work. As you can see, it's not easy to uh, crunch numbers and to make, make everything. Can you imagine your household budget is a challenge enough and trying to take care of, what is it, 780,000 uh, square foot of buildings and cross your T's and dot your I's. It's, it's, an, it's pretty much a daunting task, and, and they've done a great job with that. Thank you so much. Um, if there's no other questions, yes. If there's no other questions, that's going to wrap it up for our portion of this evening. Up next, um, the K-12, or excuse me, the K-12 uh, through 12 Foundation. Um, they're having their uh, annual membership meeting tonight. I know some people are here for that. And with that, uh, we'll bring up uh, Monica Hall. Thank you, Monica. Okay, for those who know me, I am uh, the treasurer for the K-12 Foundation, and this is our annual meeting, but I just want everybody to understand, that, you know, for those of you who are here, obviously you have to be the most concerned people <laughs> about the school and the budget, which I truly appreciate. We're not part of the school budget, and we're not part of a bond. What we are here, and we've been here for 15 years, is to let you know that we've made a commitment to the teachers, the schools, and the students and the Unified School District in one way or the other. Our latest uh, event that we just did was the Taste of Havasu. We actually raised the money before we actually give it out uh, last year, and, and fortunately for us, we, we have made over $16,000, which will be allocated uh, starting in the beginning of the year. For each school, the principal receives $2,000 to be used for whatever emergency or need he feels within his own individual or her in own individual school so that they can take care of what the school budget and the bonds don't cover. Uh, the other things that we do through the school year is to show our appreciation for the teachers and the students. We do have, uh, going backward, we just celebrated the Taste of ha we did the Taste of Havasu. Backward, we did the teacher appreciation in September, and we also did the K-12 academic recognition for the top 10 boys and the top 10 girls within Lake Havasu High School. The reason we do that every year is, is to let them know that as a community we care about them. At the K-12 Foundation Academic Recognition, not on, only are we recognizing those top 20 students, we're, we're recognizing the 20 teachers within our community that had a, an impact on their educational life in Lake Havasu City. And that's truly important for us. Some of the other programs that we do, just very quickly, is we, we do the STEM program for the the uh, kids within the grade school levels. We provide tutoring through the high school. We, we support it financially for those students who can't afford it to be able to ob obtain uh, tutoring through the uh, Lake Havasu High School. And we also, every month, do what's called the Golden Apple Award. Um, if you're a recipient, thank you. If you're not, then hopefully you strive to be one. So I would like to introduce the remaining board for the K-12. Um, some of them are here and some of them are not. Uh, Nocello Rossetti works at Com Horizon Community Bank. Lynn Edwards is an administrative assistant for Jamaica Elementary School. Amy Sukamelli works at Wells Fargo Bank. 
Marquita McKnight is the owner and graphic designer for Impro Consulting. Um, she donates and she does prepare a lot of the stuff that helps me to get the word out to the community about our organization. Jamie Hammer is a third grade teacher with Jamaica Elementary School. Dr. Michael Rosen is the chief medical officer for Havasu Regional Medical Center. Tracy Jones is the general manager at Radio Central. And Scott Becker is the principal of Lake Havasu High School. You can tell by our, our board members that we try to involve the school greatly because their input is important. And I should, shouldn't forget that Diana is our liaison that also helps us as that in between to, to help. We generally spend between forty-five dollars to $50,000 a year on the schools, the teachers, and the students. And that's our contribution as community members that say we do care about you, that we do want what's in, in your best interest, and if we can help you, we'd love to help you. Um, with that, that's pretty much it. Uh, for those that are members, I believe they, they are handing out some of the ballot forms for that. And uh, the most important part for me to be really impactful to help you guys with within this organization is to find people who can meet together and blend together that can actually have all facets of it. We're definitely covered for banking. I assure you with three people on this board for banking, we're there. We, um, we are also covered in the medical profession um, and we are uh, the representatives from the school. Uh, tonight, we would like to recommend three people to become part of our board. We are currently running at nine people. Generally, it's preferred to have 12, so we want to add to that. So the first person that we would like to add to that is Christina DeMombro. She is the chief financial officer for Havasu Regional Medical Center. She's been here since 2014, and she really does. Uh, she's been sitting in a lot of our board meetings to try to help, and she has a major impact already even before she comes on the board. Our second person is Stephanie Jarvis Martin. She is a general manager at College Street Brewhouse. It's really important for us to get somebody within the uh, field of restaurants and those types of things. Uh, Taste of House is a prime example. We had 17 different eating establishments or company, and the impact on it is huge. Uh, they had such a great time and they donated a lot of money toward our organization and toward the schools. And that $16,000 that we're giving next year is directly a result of, of their efforts to do that. And the third uh, person that we would like to also enter in is uh, Noel Atasi. Uh, she is the, her husband is uh, Dr. Atasi and she is the office manager. And we feel that we need um, a little bit more effort in the field of medical, the medical, people within our community that we have. Uh, if, however, anybody has anybody that has a, if you ever hear about anybody who has an interest in becoming a board member or would even like to sit at a board meeting and see what it's like, we do evaluate everything and we try to keep a fairly tight ship. We are financially sound and we believe in, as bankers, a lot of us believe in raising the money first before, before we promote what we are going to give out. So that's just the way we would like to do that. So if everybody could just fill out a ballot and get it back to Jamie or Lynn, either one, uh, that they could, and then we will take that vote from that. Uh, as a partner, I guess I should ask, does anybody have any questions as far as our organization, how we're trying to help you guys out there? No? Okay, well. I would encourage you, if you're not a member of the K-12 Foundation, please be a member. It's important. It's important to our community to show that if you don't believe in me or my or that you know all of us on the board, if you don't believe in us, then we're not going to be as effective. So you are our loudest voice, and we want to make sure that we're doing a good job and that I can continue to con continue to do this for many years to come. So thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to talk tonight. I appreciate it, and good luck. Slight adjustment. Once again, thanks for all, all your attention and making the effort to come here tonight. One thing I did fail to mention 
you'll start seeing signs. Signs, signs. Everywhere there's signs, right? We're working on signs to put up around the schools that show the uh, people of the community, the taxpayers, that their money's at work. Those signs will have a little bit of information on them, what uh, is going on at each of the sites and the athletic fields. So hopefully we'll roll those things out uh, sometime after the holidays, beginning of uh, 2018. And uh, we have a committee that's been working on those and uh, we'll get those things dialed in and, and made and up around. And by the way, that is strictly built, going to be paid for by citizens for Havison Schools. Does not come out of any other coffers except Tracy's paycheck, but um, all kidding aside, no, the, the citizens for Havasu Schools will pay for the signs. So that uh, I want to make that clear. Thank you again. Have a great night.